Our final speaker is Matthew Rowan, who worked with Mr. Jesse Jennison at MIT. He will speak on strongly multiplicative graphs. Okay. So um, before I delve into my project, it's important to define exactly what is a strongly multiplicative graph. So here is an example of a strongly multiplicative graph on five vertices. So to construct a strongly multiplicative graph, it has the property that if it has n vertices, you label these n vertices with the integers from 1 through n. And then any time you construct an edge between two vertices, you label that edge with the product of the two vertices that you are connecting. And our problem essentially deals with the maximal number of edges that can be constructed on a strongly multiplicative graph with n vertices, such that no two edges have the same edge label. So in the case where n equals 5, as we can see, all possible edges can be constructed. So in this case, lambda of 5, which denotes the maximal number of edges on a strongly multiplicative graph with five vertices, is 5 choose 2, or 10. But if we look at the example for 6, we notice that some of the edges cannot be constructed, since we already have edge labels of 6 and 12. So in this case, lambda of 6 is 13. And now, we're going to generalize this problem. So I developed the function f of x, y, which is the number of distinct products a, b, where a is taken from the set of 1 through x, and b is taken from the set of 1 through y. And to analyze this function, we're going to define delta sub f of x, comma, y, which is equal to f of x, comma, y minus f of x, comma, y minus 1. So alternatively, we can think of this as the number of new distinct products that can be formed uh, when y is added to the set of possible values for b, the second factor. So let's look at a numeric, numerical example of this. So we're going to examine delta sub f of 3 comma n. So if we add just the first possible value for b, namely 1, we'll notice that there are three constructible products, and previously there were none. Therefore, the delta value is 3. And then if we add 2 to the set of possible values, we notice that out of the three new possible products, one of them's already been constructed. So in this case, the delta value is 2. And we can keep doing this, and we will obtain the following sequence, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, for the first six values of delta sub f of 3 comma n. And we notice that if we spend more of our free time on this, then we obtain the following sequence. And you'll notice that it's periodic, with period 6. And additionally, you'll also notice that if you ignore the last number in the period, namely if you ignore the 1 and you look at just the first five values, so 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, this is symmetric. And we can prove both of these results. Namely, we get this periodicity theorem and this symmetry theorem. Now, we're going to let bracket x to be the set of all numbers from 1 through x. So therefore, the least common multiple of bracket x denotes the least common multiple of all the numbers from 1 through x. So we obtain the following two relations. And the intuitive reason why this is true is because any way in which you can deconstruct a product, it only really matters what y is divisible by when we consider the numbers 1 through x. So if we look at our previous example of 3, when we look at the possible ways which we can deconstruct the products, recall they were n, 2n, and 3n, the only ways which we can uh, deconstruct n is 2 times n over 2, or 3 times n over 3. And similarly, the only way in which we can deconstruct 2n is 3 times 2n over 3. So the only relevant factors are whether this number is divisible by 2 or 3. And we notice that both of these operations will preserve the divisibility of the second term in the function. And therefore, we can see that both of these theorems intuitively hold. And therefore, if we look at the limit of this function for fixed x, we can determine that the average value of the increase of this function does in fact exist because of the periodicity of the delta function, which represents the differences. And as a result, we can establish that this limit is simply equal to the average value of the function over the period of delta sub f, which is the least common multiple of bracket x. So as we can see, uh, we can denote it by this, and just to make things more simple, we're going to denote this by x bar. So now, we've developed a potential linear approximation for f of xy. And we're going to let f of xy be approximately equal to x bar times y. So for the example of 3, the average value is 2. So we obtain the following linear approximation for this function. But as you can notice, none of the values of the function are below our approximation, but a substantial number of these values are above. So our approximation needs to be shifted upwards in order to be more accurate of what's really going on in terms of this function. 
And if we look at this for f of 4 comma y, we'll notice that a similar pattern holds. We need to shift our approximation upwards in order to make it more accurate. And this becomes more apparent if we shift into just one period. So the period um, for f of 4 comma y, the uh, sequence of delta values, is 12, because that's the least common multiple of all the numbers 1 through 4. And if we examine uh, how f of 4 comma y operates over this period, we'll notice that we need to raise um, our linear approximation to get a more accurate result. So we can determine that the average error is equal to x bar minus 1 over 2. And we can obtain this from the following two lemmas, where in this case m represents some arbitrary multiple of the least common multiple of bracket x. So if we use these two lemmas, which are derived from the periodicity theorem, the symmetry theorem, and some other recursive ways of obtaining delta sub f of x comma y in terms of delta sub f of x minus 1 comma y, we can obtain that the average error is x bar minus 1 over 2. So now we're going to examine what happens when we take our approximation and we shift it up by this value. So just as a reminder, this was our old approximation. So the average value is 29 twelfths, so we're using the approximation. f of 4 comma y is approximately 29 twelfths y. But you'll notice that when we add our um, factor in, to uh, compensate for the error, then we create something that's substantially more accurate. And in fact, we can prove that the line that we have just constructed is the line of best fit for the set of data points. And the essential reason for that will begin by just looking at the last two points in the period. So if we look at the error values in these two points, namely the value of the actual function at that point minus the value of our approximation, we'll notice that these values add to zero. And in fact, this can be proved that if the second to last error value is epsilon, then the last error value is going to be the corresponding negative epsilon. And you'll also notice that if we look at the other values in the period, we can determine that these error values are also symmetric. And additionally, if you look at the first error value, which is 7 eighths, and the last error value in the sequence, which is negative 7 eighths, you can pair them off in such a way that every point with an error of epsilon has a point with an error of negative epsilon. And since this function is periodic, this sequence of error values will continue. So we've shown that you can pair a point of error epsilon with a point of error negative epsilon. So if we try to shift our line to get a more accurate approximation by some constant a, the sum of the squares of any pair of errors is now going to be 2 epsilon squared plus 2 a squared, whereas previously it was just 2 epsilon squared. So since we're trying to minimize the sum of the squares of the errors, it's optimal to have a equal to 0. So as we've shown, this is the line of best fit, assuming that the slope that we have chosen is optimal. And we can show that this is the optimal slope, since we have a different slope as um, the values of the function increase and you increase y dramatically, it will get progressively further and further away from the actual values of the function. So therefore, we've shown that the least squares regression line for f of x, y can be found by the equation y hat equals x bar y plus x bar minus 1 all over 2. And the one major thing that we're missing in this equation is how to determine x bar effectively. Since if we look at 8 for an example, to compute this, you would have to determine f of 8 uh, comma the least common multiple of bracket 8, which is 840. So you would have to do 6,720 computations just to get the products. And then you would also have to analyze how many distinct products there are. So we're going to try to see if we can come up with a method to more accurately determine the average value. And we determine that for p a prime, we can obtain the following recursion. So the average value of p is equal to p minus 1 times the average value of p minus 1 divided by p plus 1. And we do this by recursively analyzing the sequence of delta values for p in terms of the sequence of delta values for p minus 1, which leads us to the following thing which we might be able to analyze for future work. Namely, if we analyze how the average value of k relates to phi of k times the average value of k minus 1 divided by k plus this uh, error, which is e of k, we've proved that for primes, this error is equal to 1. And for analyzing composite numbers, we notice that these error values seem to increase faster than linearly. So if we come up with a good approximation, we'll be able to come up with a bound for the average value, which we could then translate into a good approximation for the function. So, in conclusion, I would like to thank my mentor, uh, Mr. Jesse Jennison, for his constant uh, support throughout this project. 
I would also like to thank my tutor, Dr. John Rickert, for the invaluable support that he's provided in editing my paper and uh, my presentation. I would also like to thank Dr. Tanya Kovanova, Dr. Kartik Venkatram, and Chris Olin for their constructive feedback on my paper, uh, Professor David Jarrison for organizing the math mentorships, a CEE, RSI, and MIT for providing me with this uh, opportunity, the entire MIT math department for their support, and also uh, my sponsors, SAP America, the Petroleum Service Company, and finaid.org. Thank you. Um, oh, so the question was, do any of my results tie back to the initial motivation behind the problem, which was graph theory? And uh, essentially the answer is no, because predominantly when analyzing this sort of a problem, it became more intuitive to look at it in terms of number theory, because all we're really analyzing is the number of distinct products that can be formed. And especially when you take it out of the context of graphs and into this function, then you're able to eliminate possible restrictions which make the function more complicated. For example, if we look at the graph, it's clear that you can't connect a vertex to itself in the definition that we've provided. And by adding this restriction that the factors cannot be equal, it complicates the values of the function, which makes it much more difficult to find this sort of a linear approximation. But by allowing the uh, factors that are chosen to be equal, and also allowing one of the, uh, allowing the cardinality of one of the sets that these uh, values can be taken from to remain fixed as the other cardinality is allowed to increase, we can get a better approximation for how this function works. So I have a follow-up. So, since you've taken an, an abstracted your problem away from the graph into this sort of setting, what would you say would be the next level of abstraction to take this further? Um, so one of the ways in which, okay, so sorry. The uh, question was, what's another way in which you could abstract this problem to sort of take it even further than I have? So I've already taken it away from graph theory into number theory, and how can I possibly take it further? So I think one of the things that, another possible generalization that you might uh, want to do in this sort of a problem is to analyze how this function works when we say that there can be at most a certain number of each product. So in this case, we've analyzed um, the generalization where the factors are allowed to be distinct and taken from separate sets. But we still have the restriction that each product can appear at most once. But if we were to eliminate that restriction, then we could further generalize the problem. Thank you. Professor Fox? Uh, what can you say about uh, estimating FYY? So when x and y are equal. Right. So uh, the question is, uh, what can we say about estimating f of yy? So when these two values are equal. So right, that's essentially going back to the initial problem. And um, I think the main thing that we have to do in order to better estimate f of yy is to come up with better bounds on the average value. Because as I've shown, the only way in which we can definitively calculate the average value that I've developed so far is by computing the function of f of y comma the least common multiple of bracket y. And as y gets considerably large, that computation becomes harder and harder to perform. And additionally, since the value that we're looking for is only f of y comma y, it wouldn't make any sense to do all the extra computation when you could much more efficiently calculate the exact value. So to look at that special case, we would need to be able to come up with some kind of recursive method of determining the average value because if we could determine the average value more effectively, then you would simply be able to uh, plug it into this uh, you know, approximation which I have constructed to get a very accurate value for what the value of the function would be. Can you tell me some bounds, like lower bounds and upper bounds? For this? So, right. So in this problem, if we go back to the initial problem of uh, lambda of n, um, there were some bounds that were established by Beinik and Hegde, who were the people who initially proposed this problem in uh, 2001. And they established that if you look at, uh, they essentially established the bounds modulo 4. So they looked at some bounds for um, lambda of 4r, lambda of 4r plus 1, lambda of 4r plus 2, and lambda of 4r plus 3. And they came up with quadratic terms in terms of r um, as upper bounds for the value of the function with coefficient 6r squared. But the upper bounds, uh, no upper bound has been established that's better than quadratic. 
And additionally, a no lower bound has been, no non-trivial lower bound has been uh, established on this function whatsoever. Mr. Katowicz? What would be a practical application of your work? <laughs> okay, so the, the question was, what would be the practical applications of your work? So I think first we have to realize that graph theory in and of itself has a huge variety of applications because it can be used to model um, a wide diversity of situations. Now for the usage of this problem in particular in the context of graph theory, there have not yet been specific instances in which this problem can be applied. But it's quite possible that in the future this sort of analysis will um, possibly be able to be applied um, in, in this sort of network modeling context. But also in terms of mathematics, uh, this problem will have implications on the divisor function, which is one of the most important functions in number theory. And it will also, because of this uh, conjecture which I have uh, established about analyzing how the average value of k um, it can be determined by phi of k over k times the average value of k minus 1, shed some more insight into the structure of primes, which may also then have applications in and of itself. All right. And once again, uh, let's thank our speakers for all their fine work. And we'd like to thank the judges for coming out this afternoon. Um, students, please follow your counselors to the convocation. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>